All right. So thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present my, my work here today. And so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, two topics. One is uh, explain briefly what this new large delimit of matrix models is and how it relates to uh, uh, SYK in particular. And the second is some applications of it, uh, and in particular to the study of phase diagrams of large N matrix quantum mechanics. So the talk really is uh, in three parts. After general introduction, this large D and the phase diagrams. And the last part, I will do most of it on the blackboard because I found it uh, clearer to, do, uh, to draw diagrams and graphs and on the blackboard. All right. So let me just remind you very briefly uh, uh, the chain of developments over the last year or so. So first of all, we found a, a class of models based on large N fermionic systems with quenched disorder, the so-called SYK models, which were uh, uh, studied originally in the condensed matter literature by Sashdev, uh, by uh, Ye and Sashdev and Georges and Parcolet and so on and so forth. And these models uh, very surprisingly turned out to display features that uh, are expected for quantum black holes, in particular this uh, chaotic behavior and the, the saturation of the bound, but also the quasi-normal behavior and so on and so forth. So that was very interesting, but also very surprising because clearly nobody, at least no string theorist, would have thought of looking at this sort of uh, quench disorder models, fermionic quench disorder models, to uh, describe black holes. Then uh, 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 Witten proposed uh, that, an, or, or remark, or make the, the, the nice remark, that uh, actually there's another class of models uh, which display, which is going to display very similar physics as SYK just be because the structure of the Feynman diagram is very similar. And these are the large N tensor models. And uh, based on the dis tensor model technology developed by uh, Bureau and Rivasso and many other people, uh, you can show that the leading large N diagrams have the same structure as in SYK. Uh, and so eventually you expect to find very similar uh, uh, physics. So this is uh, sort of very interesting. The tensor models have the great advantage over quenched disorder models in the sense that they are genuine quantum theories, including at finite n. You don't have an averaging over Hamiltonian in these cases. You have a fixed Hamiltonian, so it's a really a genuine quantum theory at finite n, and you can, uh, in particular, uh, uh, study uh, quantities that are not necessarily self-averaging, and it makes sense. So that's uh, very nice. However, both models, quench disorder or tensors, are uh, quite exotic from the point of view of string theory. It's clear that we've learned, uh, especially via the open closed string uh, duality, that the models, the quantum mechanical models that we expect to be good to describe quantum black holes are matrix models. And the reason for uh, uh, the fact that matrix models really are singled out in string theory is very, very simple. It's just the idea that open strings have two endpoints, and each of these endpoints uh, carry Champaton factors, which uh, are essentially the two indices of matrices. Okay? So it's very, very difficult to find a similar interpretation for tensors of rank three or higher, and I have no idea how a tensor model could be embedded in any way in string theory or make the link with a standard holography, which is based on you know, using really open strings and deep brains, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really matrix models that one would like to study, in my opinion, and at least before this SYK era, that's what people had been trying to do for many, many years. Uh, in spite of the lack of very precise analytical uh, uh, tools to study the models in the regime one would like to consider. So let me be a little bit more precise about the kind of models that string theory have been singling out. So it's, these are models essentially of, that originate from deep brain <coughs> constructions. Uh, and all the uh, 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 precise string theory constructions starts from a picture like this, where you have a set of D-brains uh, uh, which uh, uh, eventually will be replaced by some closed string background in the large N limit. 
And the theory that lives on the brains is a matrix theory, just because of what I said in uh, the previous transparency, because open strings attached to the D brains carry these two indices at their endpoints. So they must be studied in the large end limit. And is there a pointer, actually? Or this is a laser? Ah, yes, this is a laser. Good. OK, so they need to be uh, studied in the large end limit, first of all. And okay, the basic degrees of freedom that you always find in these theories, uh, uh, this is a basic ingredient that you have in all models. They are bosonic matrices, x, i, j, which carry an additional index mu corresponding to the motion of the brains transverse to their world volume. OK, so this is an ingredient that you have Absolute, in absolutely every brain construction. So this, uh, this is a very important ingredient that you need to have in all these models. Good. So now, this being said, I felt this very brief introduction, let me talk about something that looks very, very different, very unrelated, but uh, to me was a very important development, at least at the level of intuition, is the work by M. Paran et al which was also followed by a series of interesting papers by Minuela and collaborators, where these people have studied the large space-time dimension limit of classical general relativity. And this is much less trivial than what might have thought at the beginning, because it turns out that uh, there is, of course, a huge simplification in this limit, which is due to the fact that the gravitational law is a power law, and uh, the power is proportional, is essentially linear in the number of space-time dimension, which means that the gravitational field decays very, very quickly in large dimensions. So when you have a black hole in very large number of dimensions, all gravitational effects are localized very near the, the horizon. This, of course, simplifies dramatically the analysis because you can zoom into this region. But in spite of the simplification, uh, uh, these authors showed that you keep all the fundamental non-trivial features of black holes. For example, you can compute the quasi-normal spectrum in the, one in the large <laughs> D expansion, and the results are non-trivial. You can study uh, non-linear effects too, like uh, you can uh, work out how the collision of black holes go in this, in this approximation, and all this is very non-trivial and described quite accurately in this uh, approximation. So that's a very uh, interesting idea that large D, large number of space-time dimension in general relativity, is simplifying a lot, but still keeps the underlying physics untouched, apparently. You can still describe what you want. And to me, it provided the motivation to study the large D limit of matrix quantum mechanics, where now, what, I what is this capital D? Well, it's would be, from the point of view of the brain constructions, the number of dimensions that are transverse to the brains from which you built your holographic correspondence. Okay? So you have capital D, so the number of dimensions of the brain world volume will be kept <coughs> fixed. It's, uh, it could be one, two, three, this is fixed. But the number of transverse dimension is capital D, and this we will ta be taken to be very large. So we've seen before that uh, 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 the models contain matrices x, which are labeled by this index mu that goes from 1 to d. So at the end of the day, uh, everything boils down to studying uh, models of this sort. So you have a Lagrangian with a kinetic term. Here I am, I am looking at the example of quantum mechanics, but it could be a field theory. I, could, I would replace this kinetic term with some wave operator that doesn't change uh, the discussion. And you have a bunch of interaction terms. And the interaction terms, here I'm writing them in a very, very generic way. Okay, there are traces of a bunch of x's, and of course, the mu's must be paired two by two in order for the model to be invariant under the rotation group transverse to the brain. Okay, so there is a rule here to pair the indices mu1 with another one, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that defines a particular interaction that I uh, write like IB. So this is very, very generic. Okay? This is a very large class of matrix models that you might want to study. Now, you want to go to the large end limit. And the usual large end limit, of course, is defined by keeping the couplings Tb here fixed. 
This is the so-called Toft scaling. So this is true because I've been careful to normalize the Lagrangian with a factor of n in front. So the usual Toft scaling with this normalization is indeed that the TB are kept fixed. So that's well known. That's the large n limit that we want to take in any case. We want to go to the planar limit. What about large d? Well, the large d limit is there is one simple way to consider it. It's just by using the intuition we have from vector models. So vector models have been studied for many, many years. Uh, I think the techniques to solve them have been known in the 80s already. And so you can, of course, when you have matrices with this additional index mu, you can consider them as being vectors built of matrices. And you can say, OK, now I'm going to some sort of mixed limit, both the planar limit of matrix model and some large D limit of vector model. OK, it's not uh, difficult. And doing this is uh, uh, simply taking the TB fixed at large D2. So the large, the standard vector model large D limit, the scaling, if you put the D in front here, is TB fixed. OK, so large N to a la Toft is TB fixed. Large D standard vector model like is also TB fixed. And not surprisingly, when you do that, well, it's an interesting approximation to consider, you get an expansion, for example, of the free energy of this kind. So you have a double expansion, the expansion in powers n to the 2 minus 2g, where g is the usual genus of the Feynman diagram. And then you also have a sum over inverse powers of d, d to the 1 minus l, that corresponds to the large d expansion. Nothing here is surprising. Sorry, Frank, the mu's yeah. are pairwise contract? Yes, absolutely. So the particular pairwise contraction that you consider would define a particular interaction. Okay, I didn't indicate it here. You have many possibilities, and one gives you a particular term. And the scaling does not depend on the order of the monomial. Sorry, I didn't... Uh, the scaling does not depend on the order of the monomial, because you the more contraction you have, the more... You so in the vector model-like scaling, Everything is very simple. You just have this d in front, and this is o an OD invariant term, so d does not enter here anymore. So you, that's it. But s, I think the question was about your. So s is anything. S is the order of the interaction. Yeah, that's, I think, what ah, okay, that's okay. You can include uh, interactions. You know, s equal two is the quartic term. You can have six tick terms. Anything. You know, this is completely general here. Sorry? What is the interpretation of L? L? So L counts in the expansion of at large D. Okay, so you have a double expansion. The genus counts at large N, L at large D. You have also an interpretation for L. It's the number of loops of bubbles. Uh, for those who knows how the Feynman graph expansion of vector models goes, you have a dual the, a drawing of the diagrams in terms of loops of bubbles, and L counts the loops of bubbles. Okay, so these are all well known. Fine, so it looks like we have some nice approximation to matrix models by mixing up these two ideas of large N matrix models and large D vector models. However, this is uh, uh, very boring, uh, maybe not so surprisingly. Uh, this, when you do this, essentially what you get is vector model physics. And one uh, uh, intuition that you can have that allows you to understand this is uh, because the large N and the large D limits when you define them in this way, actually commute. So you can take first the large N limit, let's say restrict yourself to planar diagrams, and then take large D, which reduces even more the number of planar diagrams that you have considering. Or you could do the other way around. Fix N, take first large D, then you have these uh, uh, trees of bubbles, if you like, at leading order. And then, if you like, take the large N to restrict to planar trees of bubbles. But, of course, since you can't take n first, uh, sorry, if you can, uh, since you can take d first to infinity, this is done in the usual vector model-like way. And the large d model at fixed n is essentially a model with a very large number of vectors, if you like, each element of the matrices are vectors. But uh, apart from that, you don't get anything really interesting. It's a normal vector model physics. Uh, with additional decorations, if you like, due to the indices. How do you contract these indices? You use the metric, right? Uh, no, no, no. So, oops, sorry. No, so here you have, 
uh, an OD invariant quantum mechanics or model. Yeah, but how do you contract the indices, the space-time indices? So the mu's, uh, it's OD invariant. So so it's just delta function. I mean, it's a, you go. So you use the metric. The metric. The metric, which is delta, delta. Yeah, then this is quadratic plus multitrace, right, in the large dimension. That's why you get. It's not multitrace. So here it could be multitrace, but here I have been uh, looking only at single trace interactions. No, no, no. This is a trace in n, but from the point of view of large d, it's multitrace. That's because why I was confused by the fact that the scaling is always the same. Yeah. That, uh, that is, e, you, always, you always couple two indices together. So le let me write down, sorry. Le let me write down. There, there is really nothing here. So le let me write down an example, every, two examples. Every sum of d is like a trace in d. If you like, yeah. So, so you, you could have, this is one interaction, OK? So if n equal 1, let's say you go to the vector model limit, that would be the, the completely standard x to the fourth vector model. This is the first probably one that people have studied. This is uh, OD vector model, OK? n equal 1, this gives that. Now you have another possibility because n will not be 1 for me, which would be a, a contraction of this. I'm saying from the point of view of d, all yeah. of them are all, uh, these are all multi-trace. If you like, that's, that's always the case. I mean, that, that's, you know, this is x4. You know, if you have one vector, the interaction is x to the fourth, x to the sixth. So you could call that multi-trace because it's x squared. It's only delta. You can use other higher tensors and then you will have non-trivial interactions in the d direction. No. So I, I, we can discuss, but no, I, I think there's nothing here that you can do. You cannot do anything. I mean, if you want OD invariance, that's the most general thing you can, you can do. All right, uh, fine. So this is a little bit disappointing, of course. Maybe not surprising because it's not easy to find a good approximation to the sum of planar diagrams. But still, I had this idea of m paran in my head, so I, I sort of believed that something could work here. I don't know why this is doing this way. All right, so how to go around this problem? And the idea is actually as follows. Uh, the problem we have is clearly that the large d limit defined in the ordinary way do not include enough diagrams. Okay, you, you get rid of too many diagrams at leading order. So maybe an idea is to improve the situation by enhancing, enhancing some of the couplings in the large d limit. That is to say, instead of taking large d at fixed tb, let's now consider a scaling of this sort where tb is d to some power g of b, where g of b will be some number which can be strictly positive, times lambda b, and let's consider the limit of large d at lambda b fixed. Okay, that's maybe naive on the first step, but that's sort of natural. I want to keep more diagrams so that the limit is more interesting. So this is clearly a way uh, to do it. Naively, of course, if you uh, sit down and think about it uh, a few seconds, it looks impossible. It looks very naive. Indeed, if one enhances a coupling in a, uh, uh, in, in a scaling like this, diagrams that, were, uh, that contain a very large number of vertices of, this, of, the, of the enhanced type, which had some particular power of d in the standard scaling, we now have a, an, a new power of d which can be arbitrarily large. And if you consider diagrams with you know, an infinite, <laughs> at the end of the day, number of these insertions, they will blow, blow up. And so the large d limit does not exist. So that's, that's, that's a very obvious uh, remark that you can make, which means that the tough scaling really is very delicate. You know, the typically with the tough scaling, if you <coughs> enhance couplings, the limit does not exist anymore. And if you uh, uh, diminish the scaling, then the limit becomes completely trivial. So it's delicate to have a scaling where you actually keep enough diagrams to make an interesting limit, and it looks like we are very constrained here. However, and that's so the main point of the first part of my talk, that's the main result I want to point out, the fact is that for a vector matrix model, there's a remarkable feature that holds, and that saves the day. It turns out that the powers of d n of n in a given diagram are not independent. They are related. So that's the completely new result. I think that was absolutely not realized before. 
that there's an interrelationship between N and D. Let me give you a rough intuition of why this could be. The power of D in a diagram is related to the number of uh, uh, loops that you can make of the OD lines, you know, the lines of OD indices. The more loops you have, the more powers of D you have. On the other hand, the power of N is related to the genus of the surface on which you can draw the graph. Now it's clear that the number of loops that you can draw on a Riemann surface of genus G is sort of constrained by the genus. So it's not so surprising that you might get a relation between the power of D and the power of N. Okay, so that's at the level of intuition. I'm going to make very precise statements uh, very soon. But first, uh, so let me give you the, the result in a more precise way. So, and, and I'm going to do that on examples. Uh, for those of you who want the precise recipes, co come after the talk. But on examples. So here I've drawn, I have con I'm considering four, uh, three, sorry, three typical interaction terms that you might want to contemplate. So what is the precise rule to actually compute this number g of b, which is called the genus of the interaction? It has nothing to do with the genus of the Feynman diagram. <laughs> so first of all, for a term of this sort, it turns out that the genus of the interaction is zero. OK, boring. So this, I cannot do anything with, with, a, with an interaction like that. If I include it, it will be like a vector model. There's nothing you can do with it. However, with this guy, it turns out that you can enhance the coupling with g of b equal one half. So you can insert an additional square root of d in your Lagrangian in front of this term. And it will still make sense in a way that I'm going to make more precise in a couple of minutes. For this guy, the genus would be one. So you could put a, a, a factor of d enhancement in front of the coupling. Okay, and here I've just drawn you. Know, this would be the fat graph representation for a term like this. This is the fat graph representation for this term. You see that the OD loops, uh, uh, the OD lines here do not cross, and here they cross. So it's clear that the way you can draw them on a Riemann surface will be different, and that's why you can have different rules here. So now here is the precise result. With this rule, you can show that the highest power of D for planar diagrams is actually D. So even though I have enhanced the coupling, for example, of this guy, for Riemann, for a, a, a planar diagram, I still cannot possibly build diagrams that have a power greater than D. What does that imply immediately for the old scaling? For the old vector model-like scaling, an obvious consequence of this is that these vertices actually could not contribute in the planar limit. If they could contribute in the planar limit, then you could add them and, and have the limit blow away. Okay? So the so consequence is that indeed they cannot contribute in the ordinary vector model limit, but now they will contribute at leading order, but the contribution is tamed. More generally, in models with UN cross UN symmetry, so this is valid even for Hermitian models. Now in models where you would have a UN cross UN symmetry, you can extend this result to any genus. And the result is that the highest power of D of a diagram of genus G is D to the power one plus G. So there is an upper bound on the power of D for fixed genus. In other words, the large D limit at fixed genus will exist. Okay, so that's the main uh, result, technical result. And now this is the new, how the new expansion looks like. You still have the usual large N expansion, and at fixed genus now, you can expand at large D with the new scaling. So in the new scaling, the expansion parameter is one over square root of D, and the highest power at fixed g, as I said, is, uh, is 1 plus g. And of course, I'm sorry, this n should be a d. 
Okay, this is the large D expansion, so that's a very bad typo. <laughs> so, okay, so this here it's a D to the power 1 plus G minus L over 2. Okay, it's the large D expansion. And G here is the <coughs> whole genus? So G is the genus the, of the Riemann surface, of the Feynman diagram, the usual one. So this, this is correct. Everything is correct here except this N that should be a G. <laughs> Sorry about this. So, Frank, if you think of X mu as a tensor, do you get one of Rasband's models? So, uh, uh, ask again in two minutes, after a couple of more transparencies. <laughs> so, <coughs> what about taking N equal, well, what about taking D equal <coughs> N squared? Oh, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. So, the limit would not exist then, if you take D equal N squared. All right, so crucial property of this new large D limit, they do large D and large N now do not commute. Okay? If you uh, want to take this new large D at fixed N, it's clear that you can consider diagrams of arbitrarily high genus, and those can have arbitrarily high powers of D. So the large D limit at fixed N do not exist. But if you first take the large N limit, let's say you restrict to planar diagrams, this is the leading order, then the new large D limit exists. And you get a new 1 over square root of D expansion of Feynman diagrams. So, uh, 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 sorry. Okay. So the result of all these uh, uh, tricks is that uh, uh, you get a new sort of approximation to the uh, sum of the planar diagrams, that is associated with large D, but which contains much more diagrams than what you would get in a vector model like large D. And what these new diagrams are, well, they are melons or generalized melons, which makes the link with SYK and tensor models. Okay, so you're getting here, again, if you like, it's a third way to get again the same sort of general structure of Milon or generalized Milons of Feynman diagram in a, a systematic expansion at large D for matrix models. So the main bonus, of course, is that we are now dealing with completely standard matrix quantum mechanical or field theoretical models. Okay? You don't need to go to exotic uh, quench disorder or tensor models. It's completely standard matrix models in a new systematic expansion at large D. From that point of view, it's not surprising that uh, 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 you would get black hole physics out of this set of Feynman diagrams, since they are precisely coming in, mod coming in, in models that string theory have been telling us for many years that they should be describing black holes. Uh, there was a question. Yes. Can you say again what the your Lagrangian is at the end? The one so the Lagrangian, okay, I could come back. The Lagrangian is a completely general OD symmetric matrix model. Take anything. And I gave you the rules, not in details, because I didn't really tell you how you compute this G of B. But there's a rule, a mathematical rule. Any model, you give me any matrix model, which is OD invariant, so you have matrices X mu, maybe you have X mu, Y mu, Z mu. Okay, of course, I didn't say that, but it's obvious. You can have flavors of matrices. Maybe some of these matrices are bosonic, others are fermionic. That doesn't enter into these arguments. Anything. Can you write an example of one? So, okay, let me come back then. Okay, here it is. Here it is. So you have a kinetic term. I wrote it for quantum mechanics. You could do field theory, of course. I could write here a kinetic term for higher dimensional field theory. And then any interaction, IB of X. And here I restricted myself to a single trace interaction. I could actually do also do the discussion for multi-trace interactions. That will be done in a paper that will appear very soon. And why does that only have melons? So in the, large D, in the new large D limit that I have defined, it turns out that the leading diagrams are melons, or generalized melons. Uh, why? Okay, I can, I can, you can read the paper. Uh, uh, you can prove that. Okay, so that's the result. I don't, I don't give the proof here, but, but that's the result. Of tensor, right? They are large in three indices, so they look like yeah. tensor. Tensor at 
they look like because you have these three indices, but they're not. It's both like tensors and with addi some additional ingredients, but you can prove it. Okay, that's the result. That's the, the new result. And There's something confused, Frank, because in the tensor models, d is equal to n is taken to infinity. Yes, and they have the same symmetry Here rules. You claim that n has to be taken first to infinity. Yes. And yet you end up with the same diagram. Only at leading order. Only at leading, yes. order. at leading order. Yes. Because the leading order for d equal n is matching here the leading order when you take first n to infinity and then d to infinity. That's not hard to tell. I can, I can give you the... That's not very hard to understand. Uh, that's not surprising. Right. That's so not you mentioned something about the higher dimensional uh, theories. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you investigate uh, if you can get any strong interacting... We started. It's sort of hard. We're not there yet. Uh, I, will, uh, I don't know if I will have time, but even for the quantum mechanical example, I, want to, I would like to mention that many things actually are still not understood. So, all right. So let me try to maybe go a little bit faster. Okay, this, this was here, this is done. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so the, the, the last remark it was that, you know, I, I think the, the reason to me why SYK is relevant to black hole is really from what I just said, that the same structure of diagrams can actually also show up in, in this context of matrix quantum mechanics. And then there's no surprise that this could describe uh, black holes. Okay, another bonus I, I can mention it briefly is that it's possible to deal with the planar limit of Hermitian matrix models. So where you just have one UN symmetry, not UN cross UN. So that's very unlike tensor models, where you need a UN symmetry per index. Okay? Otherwise, the large N limit does not work. And this is something you can do precisely because you take first large N, so you first go to planar, and then large D. So that's an additional sort of bonus compared to the usual tensor model, even though a lot of the underlying techniques are similar, but that's a new uh, a new thing. To my, to my knowledge, that's the only way to actually reduce the symmetries of these models and still having a limit that makes sense. <coughs> the new large D limit, let me mention that very briefly, is consistent with linearly realized supersymmetry. So the large D scaling that you have to take actually commutes with supersymmetry. So supersymmetry relates different interaction terms. So you have to check that the way it relates these interaction terms is consistent with the rule to assign powers of D to the couplings. And that's working, that is okay. So you can study uh, 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 also supersymmetric models in various number of dimensions, zero plus one, but also one plus one and two plus one. Sorry, but with SUSY, you don't have arbitrary trace. I guess you, you must take the one which appear in your mills or something. Four? I, I, if you take the No, so up to four supercharges, I can have arbitrary traces because it's like a superpotential. And so I think the most interesting models in this class are probably models with four supercharges, which are very hard to study f with ordinary techniques, but which are known to be actually the most interesting. So, you know, it's sort of nice maybe that these are the ones that are also natural here. You know, so, so uh, yeah, they can be much more general, and uh, I think they are the most interesting for, for the physics point of view. So this is for the future, but uh, they are there. Okay, just to uh, very briefly answer a, a question by Costas, uh, with, uh, how, is, how is it related to Gouraud scaling, etc.? So it turns out that this uh, idea of enhancing uh, uh, coupling, if you like, came back well, to many people, but in particular there's a very nice paper by Caro Santanasa in 2016, which was then used by Klebanov and Taponowski uh, last December, where also they used this idea of enhanced coupling in a very special instance, in a very special case. Now, just to mention it very briefly, this is a work uh, essentially that will be, uh, I think, published uh, soon, uh, do, done with Vincent Rivasso and uh, uh, Guillaume Vallette. Uh, it turns out that the Gouraud scaling, the standard bonzon gouraud rivasso scaling of general tensor models, can be improved in the sense that you can enhance the coupling in a way which is like that. So the new scaling, the, the old scaling would be mu a fixed. Now you're going to take lambda a fixed. So 
all the couplings with this degree, so-called Gouraud degree, uh, uh, strictly positive, will be infinitely enhanced. There's a way to do that. And what is quite nice is that the, ex the new large N expansion of tensor models that you get in this way is uh, uh, the diagrams are now classified by a new quantity. So the uh, uh, traditional quantity in tensor models is the, the uh, uh, Gouraud degree. I don't want to explain in many details what, it, what this is, but let me just tell you that the leading graph, the graphs of degree zero, which are also called superplanar, intuitively they are graphs that are essentially defined by the property that whatever way you draw them on a the surface, they're always planar. Which means that you know, to draw a graph on a surface, you need to pick at each vertex a cyclic ordering of the lines incident to the vertex. So here you have many lines because you have all these tensor indices. The Gouraud degree graph, uh, the, the, the degree zero graphs, are those that whatever cyclic ordering you choose, they're always planar. Okay? So this is the Gouraud degree. Now, with the enhanced scaling, large end scaling that we're considering, uh, the, the Gouraud degree is replaced by uh, uh, what we call an index, and the index zero graphs are different. The index zero graphs are as follows. When you have a tensor with R indices, you can always pick two of them and forget about all the others. That define a matrix model. The graph associated with the tensor model can then be written as a standard fat graph, just keeping you know, the lines, the strands associated with the two indices that you've picked. For each such choice, you just have a genus associated with the diagram. Now take any possibility, pick any two indices. You find a genus for each choice, sum over all these genera, this is the index. Okay? So it's very natural, in some sense, it's like testing all the possible ways to make matrix models from a tensor, and you sum all the genera that result, that's the index. And so the graph that dominates of index zero are the graph for which the matrix model graph that are associated to are always planar, whatever way you define the notion of matrix by picking up two indices. All right, so this will be published soon too. All right, in the last 20, do you have questions? So this ends the first part of the diagrammatic large N, large D part. Now I would like just to discuss very briefly the, uh, some of the applications, and in particular applications to the phase diagram of the models. So we now have a vast class of models that, that we can study and they are not exotic at all. Okay? So the simplest one would be something very similar to SYK or some generalization by SASHDEF. Consider a Hamiltonian of this sort based on matrices, psi mu, which are Dirac fermions. So they are really quantized by just uh, 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 deciding that they satisfy this uh, standard anti-commutation relations. Okay? Very basic and, and very natural Hamiltonian to look at. The crucial new ingredient is that we're going to take large N, so planar, but also large D with the square root of D here that enhanced the interaction. And capital lambda, capital M will be the two parameters and they will be kept fixed. Okay. So this is an example of a matrix quantum mechanics that you can study. Um, other example, <coughs> bosonic. So you take a Hamiltonian with bosons and an interaction similar to this one. This is an unstable model. It turns out, you can check, it's not too hard, to check that an interaction trace of x mu, x nu, x mu, x nu is not stable. Uh, you can find uh, directions where uh, the, the term can be arbitrarily high or arbitrarily low. But you know that at large n, unstable models still make sense. So you can consider it. You can also consider bosonic stable models. For example, this is a very nice interaction, x mu, x rho, x mu, x nu, x rho, x nu, which is manifestly positive definite because essentially it's the square of a Hermitian matrix here. So this is very well and uh, well defined. So why don't you take the commutator squared in the, third, in the second example? So commutator squared is not good because it will mix, so that's an unfortunate situation, it will mix x mu, x mu, x nu, it will mix these two terms. 
No. Sorry. It's equivalent to the first then because you only keep the dominant one. If I understand. Uh, no. So the the second one will. It depends how then the problem Why is then the that the large descaling of these two will not be the same. So you cannot keep the commutator uh, structure. If uh, I, I was very brief, but if you remember, this cannot be enhanced. Okay, so the large descaling here will be standard vector model like. This, this one can be and should be enhanced. If you don't enhance, you get vector model physics, not interesting. Mm -hmm. But then if you enhance it, they don't play the same role and they no longer appear as a commutator squared. Yeah. And of course, you can do supersymmetric models with two or four supercharges, uh, taking, for example, a superpotential of this sort which no will, of course, yield a stable model. If you take a superpotential of this sort, the potential will be actually this term, and you will have additional fermionic terms. So we've, we are now studying all these guys. And it turns out that very little is known about these models. What is their phase diagram? What are their properties? Six months ago, I think nobody would have even dreamt of being able to say anything reliable about these guys in the strong coupling region. Okay, so it's a completely new arena to play. And even it turns out that even for the fermionic models that look very much like SYK, so the, the first Hamiltonian I draw, there are very big surprises. And I hope I have time, maybe yes, to uh, describe briefly what these uh, are. And so this is a work that is uh, no near completion with uh, Tetsuo Azeyanagi uh, in Brussels and Fidel Chaposnik in uh, Seoul. So let me just give you the intuition of the parameter space or the phase diagrams of these models. What do you expect? Okay. So we have three parameters. Of course, you could have more, more complicated guys, but the, the basic physics is captured with these models with three parameters. So you have the mass, okay, which gives just the, the, the frequencies of the harmonic oscillator limit of the model, of the weakly coupled limit of the model. You have a coupling, lambda, and the temperature. All these three I choose to be of dimension of a mass, okay, or of an energy. So really the dimensionless parameters, you have only two. And I will call them little m, which is capital M divided by lambda, little t, capital T divided by lambda. I use that because of course the model with capital lambda is zero is trivial. It's just a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so capital lambda will never be zero. Maybe you can set it to one, that set the scales, and then you have really two interesting parameters temperature and m. So what is this plane? What does it look like? It has different regions. First, you have this region up here, which is large t at fixed m. Okay, And fixed m could be m equals 0. If you take m equals 0, this is actually SYK. So this regime is the perturbative regime where the Feynman graph that are used in SYK to eventually go to strong coupling after summation are defined. Okay? SYK, it's also defined perturbatively to start with because it's based on Feynman diagrams. So the Feynman diagrams of SYK, the perturbation theory, corresponds to this regime here. But of course you have another regime, perturbative regime, which is actually more standard, I would say, which is the standard textbook perturbation theory of a model of very large m at fixed temperature. So this would be the standard perturbation theory that you have in textbook around the Fock vacuum. So this is where you know, the mass of the harmonic oscillator, if you like, term is very high, the coupling is very small, so you perturb with a standard propagator around the Fock uh, vacuum and, and you do that. And this would be this region here. But your, sorry, Mark, mm -hmm. your oscillate mass is the same for all oscillators. Uh, yes, because of OD same invariance. As this is non cam uh, cam agora parnold mother regime. So it's not integrable and chaotic for any in classical dynamics. It's chaotic for 50%. It's chaotic, yeah. It's chaotic because uh, cam cannot be applied and for any small perturbation. It is. It is. It is. But it is perturbative in the sense that, for example, if you want... It's not perturbative. No. In this regime, yes. If you want to compute the free energy, for example, okay, as a function of temperature, you do a one-loop calculation, you get an extremely precise formula for the 
free energy. That's what I mean by perturbative. But you're right if you look at the real-time two-point function, even here, very far here, it will be chaotic, so it will, it will develop non-perturbative features that will not be captured by perturbation theory. But it is perturbative in the sense that you have a very small coupling, and in particular to compute any thermodynamic quantity, entropy for energy, etc., I could reliably do, and do it in a perturbative expansion. Even the three-level result would be already precise here. That's what I mean. But you're right, and I, if I have time, I'll come back on what you say. So do you restrict to gay singlets? Or, uh, Sorry? Do you restrict to gay singlets? So you could, but at leading order, that's something I didn't say, you don't need. Because the uh, 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 gauge group rank is n. Since d is large, at leading order, all my actions have, are of order n squared d. So uh, gauging un is a subleading. You know, the gauging un will give you ghost terms, etc. But all these terms know only about the un part, not the od part. So they give contributions of order n squared, which are subleading in the large d expansion. Okay, so that's a very good point. So do I understand correctly that the Hamilton temperature would be zero? Yes. Here, yes. In the large d limit. But if you compute the 1 over d correction, you'll start to see this. Okay, it's like you know very well, of course. Okay, so you, the effective action that you compute will be n squared d, but all the terms coming from the integral over the unitary group, this uh, trigonometric van der Mond, etc., that will be of order n squared. So subleading at leading order. But you could see the effect, but that would be a harder calculation. We started to think about it, but I think it's for later because it's a sort of hard calculation. All right. So what, 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 what did I say here? I'm just saying that there's an effective coupling in this uh, theory, which is really the minimum of 1 over m and 1 over t. Okay, the 1 over m is the usual, maybe most familiar coupling that uh, governs perturbation theory here, but you also have 1 over t here. And the reason that you have that is that, of course, with fermions, the zero mode takes a mass which is proportional to the temperature. Because of that, the large temperature limit for fermions is always weakly coupled. And here you can start to see very, uh, uh, an important difference with bosonic system. In, with bosonic system, the large temperature limit is, has no reason to be weakly coupled. It's classical, but it's not weakly coupled. For fermionic system, it will always be perturbative, and that's at the basis, actually, of the whole SYK business, because that's how they define the diagrams here. Fine. Okay, so this is the phase diagram, per a perturbative region here, but here a non-perturbative region. Now, in this perturbative region, of course, you can compute the, the entropy. It's very simple. The, uh, 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 here, it's, uh, it will be non-zero, because you perturb essentially around zero Hamiltonian, so you perturb around the state of maximal entropy. So it's just log two per degrees of freedom. Here, it would be the most, more standard perturbation theory, where you have just harmonic oscillators. So here, the, 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 temp the, the entropy would go to zero uh, uh, exponentially fast when the temperature goes to zero as usual. The fantastic thing is that in these models, you can actually compute the entropy all the way down here to zero temperature, which is very strongly coupled. So the strongly coupled, so I don't explain how to do that because that's not SYK. You don't have auxiliary fields, etc. So there's a little bit of technology that I'm not talking about. But still, you can do things that are similar to SYK. Okay, I'm not explaining that. But you can compute the entropy in the zero temperature limit, little t equals zero. That's the result, ca the Catalan number divided by phi, by pi plus one quarter log of log two. That's a number. And numerically, you can actually go from very weak coupling to super strong coupling. That's mar a marvelous uh, property of these uh, this models. But you can do it everywhere. OK, so now this is the puzzle about the, the phase diagram here. Here it's not mysterious. Okay, you start from a perturbative regime which already has a non-zero entropy at zero's order. You're going to sum up planar diagrams or Feynman diagrams, and okay, you do that. That's SYK-like things, and you go to a non-zero zero temperature entropy with all the SYK-like physics that uh, we are now uh, starting to be familiar with. However, if you do it here, that's completely different. Here, this is harmonic oscillator physics with a zero entropy at zero temperature, and actually exponentially vanishing 
entropy at zero temperature. How can you go then in this direction? You know, the SYK is this. That's well known, well understood. What about this? What is this part of the phase? That how, how do you make the link between ordinary perturbation theory, harmonic oscillators, and this regime of non-zero entropy at zero temperature? Okay, let me skip that. that, that that's the, the, what you would have for boson. And if you want the answer, I think I have, I should have five minutes. I can draw on the blackboard the answer, okay, to this, uh, to this puzzle. So maybe if you can switch off the, uh, this and I will use, I just need one blackboard. And I will just give you the answer in this model. But that's uh, the basic physics that opens the way to understand the phase diagrams for many more models. So, you had here uh, uh, N and you had here T, okay? And I want to understand how I go there. Let me draw another curve, which is the entropy, it's very useful, as a function of mass. And I will do that for various temperatures. Let me do it first for T equals zero. So for T equals zero, it's the well, you have the well-known SYK-like solution, generalized to finite M. SYK would be M equals zero, if you like. But fine, it's just a generalization that Sashdef actually has studied. So that's well-known. You can draw, and that's what you get. So here you get this uh, uh, Catalan, this number here is Catalan over pi, uh, etc. And, and this is what you get. Here you get. So you, you, you increase the mass, the entropy diminishes. But remarkably, so that's one first new feature, you realize that the solution ends here at some critical mass. So the SYK solution, like solution actually does not exist for all values of n. Okay, so this is the first crucial feature. Uh, people have not uh, realize that in the condensed matter literature, for one reason, it's because they study the model not as a function of the mass, but as a function of the charge. Okay, which is the mass is like some chemical potential for some charge. Okay, and if you fix the charge, here actually along this curve, you get all the possible values of the charge. So you don't realize that by doing that, you're actually missing a huge part of the, f of the, of the, of the curves, uh, on a huge part of what could happen. So that's it. Now, second surprise, do you have colors? Yes. There is another solution. So the Schwinger-Dyson equation turned out to have two solutions, not only the SYK solution, but another one, which actually describes this perturbative regime, oscillator harmonic-like. And this guy has zero entropy everywhere for all masses. So you have two. This guy has zero entropy. It has also zero free energy. This guy has some entropy and some free energy that you can compute. And you can compare. And you find there's a phase transition. For some m, which is not, so I shouldn't call that mc. Let's call that m star. There is no an MC here, strictly less than M star, where this solution becomes more stable than the green solution. This MC is here. And that's a first order phase transition, because you jump from here to there. Now let me draw the uh, entropy as function of mass. So this was for zero temperature. Let me do it for some finite temperature. You will have a curve here, which is very similar. Do I have something to, yeah. That's okay, that's okay. I'm almost done. Okay, you do it. You find that the curve ends here, you know, at finite temperature. It doesn't go to zero anymore. And the green solution still exists but also not for all masses, it will do something like that. So you still have 
a regime of parameters where actually two solutions coexist and you have to check out which one is the most stable. And again, you'll find some critical mass. Okay, so that will be what we are starting to describe here is a line of first order phase transitions in this Tm plane. Now I can keep going, still increase the temperature. And then the most remarkable feature of the model show up. There's a critical point. There's a critical point. So that's now for T equal some very special temperature Tc. There's a critical point where this guy ends always like that. And now this guy does exactly this. And they meet. Here it means that this line of first order phase transition ends at a critical point, which is very much like the gas uh, liquid uh, critical point in the phase diagram of water, if you like. And then if you go to higher temperature, you have no longer two solutions. You just have one solution to the schwinger dyson equation, and this curve becomes a very boring curve, monotonically decreasing curve like that, which describes this region. Okay? So this is the result, this is the phase diagram of, this, uh, of the model. This region was, was well known, the rest is new. And in particular, so to uh, 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 come back maybe of what you on what you said, uh, that was one of the puzzles I had. So here it's very, very perturbative. Still, if you turn on a little bit the temperature, you expect indeed chaos, you expect continuous spectrum, Etc. This is a finite temperature matrix quantum mechanics. So it, it should have all these features. So it's like a black hole here, some sort of black hole of very low entropy. So it will be a super stringy small black hole. Whereas here, it's much more like a holographic black hole, large black hole with non-zero entropy. So it can it can be extremal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These two things look very very different, and indeed in some sense. There is a first order phase transition if you want to go from one to the other through this line here. On the other hand, they are not really different. They are both chaotic, they both have quasi normal behavior, etc. In the same sense as liquid water and, and, and gas water are not really different. And that's because you don't really have an order parameter that distinguishes them, and you can actually continuously join the two regions through this path in uh, the parameter space, if you like. And so this is a way to continuously go from ordinary perturbation theory around the harmonic oscillator to this extremal black hole behavior with macroscopic non-zero entropy at zero temperature. <coughs> My last word is that, okay, that's interesting for fermions, but that's vital for bosons. Because for bosons, you don't have the perturbative <coughs> regime here that allows you to do like SYK. If you want to understand systems with bosons, you need to start always from a region like here. This is the only region where you can define Feynman diagrams. And that's why we were stuck for a lot of time in trying to understand the bosonic models, because we thought they would be very similar to fermions, but no, they're actually not, because they don't have the SYK-like perturbation theory. And so you need to understand that you can have these very interesting sort of phase transitions in the, in the parameter space to 